Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Our program tonight focuses on issues that I know matter deeply to all of us who believe that schools should be a place where all students can have a voice, uh, express how they feel, learn about history that informs not only our past but our present, and ultimately learn how to participate in a democratic society. Paying particular attention to how political polarization and social inequality uh, affect classroom dynamics, our speakers argue that teachers can create political classrooms, which engage students in rich discussions about controversial issues that consider the question, how should we live together? It's a question that's very important and one that I'm sure that's on a lot of your minds this evening. Diana Hess is the Dean of the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she holds the Karen A. Falk Distinguished Chair of Education. Her research focuses on uh, civic and democratic education. Diana is the author of two award-winning books, Controversy in the Classroom, The Democratic Power of Discussion, and The Political Classroom, Evidence and Ethics in Democratic Education, which she co-authored with our other speaker, Professor Paula McAvoy. Diana is currently a principal investigator of a multi-year study on the, the Discussion Project, a professional development program that aims to help instructors create inclusive, engaging, and academically rigorous uh, discussions in higher education. She has been the senior vice president of the Spencer Foundation, a high school teacher, uh, a teacher union president, and the associate executor, executive director of the Constitutional Rights Foundation in Chicago. Paula McAvoy, is an associate professor of social studies education at North Carolina State University. Her research focuses on empirical and philosophical questions related to the aims and practices of democratic education. Paula leads professional development workshops around the country aimed at helping teachers and university faculty engage students in discussions of controversial political issues. She is currently working on a book project called Just Teaching, Just Teacher, taking the ethical long view in the profession of, ed of teaching. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club, uh, Diana and Paula. So Great to be here. I, I'm glad that you are here. I saw them <laughs> working through some tech stuff and we made it, so we're, we're good to go and I look forward to our exchange. So I, I'd love to get the conversation started by giving you an opportunity to share your motivations for writing the book that you co-authored together. Um, and if once you share your motivations, I'd love for you to give a retrospective look. It's been about seven, almost eight years uh, mm -hmm. since that book with author, was authored, and a lot of things have transpired since then. So I'd love for you to first frame it out, like what, what pulled you together and to do this, and then how are you looking at it now through the rearview mirror? And then we'll be off and running. Great, well, I'll start. So the political classroom is based on a longitudinal study that uh, began in uh, 2005. And it was a study that looked at what young people learned from discussions of highly controversial political issues in classrooms compared to what happened in classrooms without those kinds of discussions. What teachers who were really good at this did, and importantly, what impact it had on young people after they uh, graduated from high school. It was a longitudinal study that looked at students two and then four years out after high school. Mm -hmm. So my primary motivation for the very beginning of the study was to do something that had a longitudinal component that's a very rare kind of research mm -hmm. in our field, the field of mm -hmm. social studies. And as a former high school teacher, you know, I always wondered, you know, what difference did it really make um, on the lives of my students. And that's a question that lots of teachers have. And we hope that um, the study could uh, begin to answer that. So that was my primary motivation. Paula, what about you? <laughs> well, I joined the study. I was actually um, still a doctoral student at UW-Madison um, and joined the study kind of in the early couple of years. Um, but I was, my um, PhD is in philosophy of education. And so I was working on this empirical study, um, and I was managing a lot of the qualitative data. So we had over 250 interviews with students um, at the end of the courses that we were looking at. 
uh, and their teachers and you know working through this data and Diana and I would actually stumble across you know get into these discussions about like, well, what does that mean and should they be doing that and what's this about and um, defining terms and so the philosophical part kind of got added into the the book so the book be is both the findings of the study mm -hmm. uh, rich cases of teachers practicing um, discussions in different political contexts and then uh, we address some of the ethical challenges that teachers face when they bring politics into the classroom and i think i i my motivation was that i i was a high school teacher in california for 10 years um and uh this is just i think uh, discussion in the classroom is the most exciting and challenging thing you can do. And so I think that that's uh, really what hooked me. Great. So I'd love it if you could take that retrospective look. Yeah. Seven or eight years removed, looking back on the book. How is it holding up? And, and what are the things that you wish you would have been able to anticipate at that point or things that you were reconsidering at this point in the game? <laughs> Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that at the time we collected the data, the United States was polarized for sure, but nothing compared to what we are seeing today. And so one of the things that we focused on in the book was how teachers who lived in different um, kinds of political communities dealt with discussions of highly controversial political issues. We literally had classrooms that were kind of red classrooms, blue classrooms, and purple classrooms. And we were really interested in how the political context influenced what happened in, in these classrooms. And I think the book was one of the first things published in our field that really focused on what impact political polarization and ideologically homogenous communities had on what was happening in classrooms. So we were really struck by that at the time and it was very, very interesting. But now when I look back, um, I, I, I'm, I find it interesting how we thought that time was so polarized. <laughs> as now it, it doesn't seem anywhere near as um, serious as, as what we're contending with today. So, you know, when I talk with teachers and I do, you know, lots and lots of of things with teachers. We just had a conference here in uh, Madison last week called Teaching About the Elections for K-12 teachers from across Wisconsin. And one of the things that you know I point out to them is that even though I think the central tenets of the book still hold, mm -hmm. that the environment that they're teaching in, because it's more polarized, I think is more challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Would you like to speak I think to that? I, I would add that, um, you know, I think the book Quite honestly, you know, we take as a given that the United States is a democracy and that there's wide consensus that we should be a democracy. And I think what has dramatically changed mm -hmm. since the publishing of the book is that the question, should the United States be a democracy or exactly what kind of democ democracy we want to be, is now being opened as a controversial issue. Um, and so I think this has created a tremendous challenge for teachers in the classroom. And then related to that problem is of course, all the legislation that happened in the past year at the district and state level um, that has really uh, made schools um, one of the lightning rods or it's an institution that's under deep public scrutiny right now because um, it's been shown to be politically effective to start to rile up parents around issues related to school especially around controversial issues. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Schools, from my vantage point, have always been a site of contestation. And oftentimes mm -hmm. when there are big and significant shifts taking place sort of politically or socially, schools become the place where a lot of that sort of gets hashed out. So I think, uh, I think you're, you're spot on. So, so one of the things that you mentioned in your book, there's a variety of structural factors that contribute to some of these things. And so if I can sort of go to my list here, it said, among them, you listed partisan politics, economic inequality, immigration, and increasing, increasingly polarized uh, public, and the role of journalism. And I guess I would probably add to that sort of a fractured media market, which is, you know, the disruption of technologies has fundamentally changed our, our, our media market, and I think that's a challenge. But as you look back at those structural factors that contribute to the polarization that you're attending to in the book, are there some of those that you feel are more consequential than others? 
Um, and if so, why? What, are there certain things you think that are driving this in ways that are um, more problematic or consequential? Yeah, that's a great question. I would I would say that I think um, that you know the the tremendous wealth inequality in the United States and other countries that are experiencing rising authoritarianism it you know is an often under discussed aspect of what's going on. That there are it's easy to sort of think, oh, you people were just duped, um, and that's why you're be, you know why you're storming the Capitol. <laughs> but you know there are legitimate concerns that the uh, in our you know I think wealth inequality is is really driving a lot of this, and that we have to really attend to uh, you know how how we're taking care of everyone in the country, and you know and then add to that um, that since the book has come out, um, the you know George Floyd and the racial reckoning of 2020 um, has you know sort of a, you know further exacerbated our divisions um or brought to light divisions that were already there but the um so you know i think that to me i i really try to encourage people to think about wealth inequality as a really important question about how should we live together are we comfortable with the amount of uh inequality that we have in the country mm -hmm. thank you for that did you want to speak to that yeah, I'll add to that. I think the media landscape, especially the social media landscape, is different um, than it was certainly at the time we began the study. I mean, I think there are, you know, genuine and serious concerns about what we label as fake news. Um, I think it's one of the consequences of that is we need to change what we teach young people in school. They need to learn a lot more about how to assess the veracity of the information they encounter via social media or online generally. And I think that's one of the biggest changes we've seen in civic education in the last five years. Yeah, so let, let's cycle back to wealth inequality. I mean, being here in the Bay Area, it's hard not to sort of look at that and see the, the profound changes that have evolved and emerged over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. And, and the reality is like in our society, in the capitalist society, we've actually always had segments of the population that have been outside of the, the broader benefits of, of democracy. And yet they're not all storming the capital. The storming of the capital seems to be tied to a very particular sense of uh, positionality within society. And so as we're shifting demographically and the consequences of our historical inequality are felt more broadly, um, how do we understand this through the lens of history? Because the reality is we could look back in our past and look at how various different groups have struggled with uh, being outside of the, the benefits of, of democracy and have yet still found ways to participate. Uh, historically, that's been military service and a variety of other ways in which they contributed to the community because they believed in the promise of democracy. So how do we end up at a point in which now the, the very promise of democracy is being held in question? Um, it's, it's, it's challenging. I think when I, when I look, you know, I think that um, a lot of the public institutions that helped do the work that you're talking about that maybe buffered against wealth inequality, mm -hmm. like, like un dismantling of unions, mm -hmm. uh, making, you know, universities exhort, you know, the cost of universities mm -hmm. going up um, so that students are working hard and, you know, not able to mm -hmm. engage, you know, civically and politically in college. So, um, we have a, you know, and part of that is part of the part of the ideological differences of the parties that, uh, you know, the, a conservative view that we should be completely distrustful of anything that comes that under the label public <laughs> um, is, you know, that's, as, you know, having having people be distrustful of any solution that might come from the government. Uh, is a real problem. And we saw this at the pandemic, that the, the deep distrust of, of just basic science um, or, and, the, and the basic idea that we could be collectively caring for one another. And so, um, you know, I think that we've, since really the, the 1980s have been, there's been a dismantling of the public sphere. And so we now have, you know, Twitter has maybe filled the void, which has not been a great replacement. And so, um, we need, you know, I think we need to really think about what, how, how we 
you know, build up the institutions that help people work together to solve problems together. Because the reality is that when people are talking to one another at the ground level, uh, they they tend to find reasonable positions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's just that we um, we there's so much national noise that we distrust one another. We just distrust our institutions, etc. So, um, you know, that's a, I think trust has become a real problem in public. One of the things that I've noticed is how we have changed the conceptualization of the purpose of education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you even you know think about the labels that have been used for the last 20 years, you know, no child left behind and race to the top, you know, very much about education as a private good. Mm -hmm. You know, we educate people so they can be more economically successful etc and clearly that's one of the reasons for education but i think that we have lost the sense of how important it is to educate for a sense of the public and how education is a public good our rhetoric has just changed about it and it's hard to tell you know how much of it is the the rhetoric reflected reality or the reality you know responded to the <laughs> rhetoric but i really noticed that with the students i interact with you know in higher education is that they're really focused on you know preparing for their private lives and i certainly you know we want students to get good jobs and we want students to have rich private lives but i think back to what paula was saying these thick bonds of community that are so important if you're going to have a democracy that is sustainable and a democracy that thrives we need to come up with a way of re-knitting those mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do think that there's a role for institutions. And yet, as, as Paula said, as, as we move forward as a society, we oftentimes either lose faith in or underfund the very institutions that have made us the society that we are. We look at the rising cost of education as an example, something that Heather McGee goes into in her book, The Some of Us, sort of our self-cannibalism. But w one of the things that you actually called out, if we, if we begin to look at education as a resource, uh, that means to an end is AP courses, right? So in the political classroom, you note that AP classes and AP tracks effectively create a school within a school for the top students, right? Do you think that AP classes should exist? Mm -hmm. And if yes, what should we look like and how should we structure them? Because as somebody who does work in schools, you can almost predictably walk through the halls and know which classes are which without having, having any sense of uh, you know, uh, a course list. So how, how do we talk about that as well? Yeah, that was one of the most controversial things we wrote about in the book. Um, mm -hmm. So I have kind of three thoughts about AP classes. One is that I think there are a lot of great AP classes. And mm -hmm. I think the work that's been done to change the way that AP classes are taught has been really helpful. You know, 10 years ago, a lot of AP classes were primarily lecture classes where there wasn't a lot of interaction um, among and between students, you know, very traditional forms of teaching. And there has been a lot of work done to change some AP classes. Walter Parker and his colleagues at the University of Washington worked on the AP government and civics class. There's been some work done on the environmental science class mm -hmm. to turn those classes into classes that quite frankly are just pedagogically more sound. I think that's a good thing, but I think the challenge that, that you're uh, referring to that we talked about in the book is that AP classes you know, provide a mechanism for extreme sorting. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems with extreme sorting is A, we have some students getting some opportunities and other students not getting them, but we also lose one of the reasons we have schools, which is an opportunity for students who are different from one another to learn together and to learn about one another. And I think when we have the kind of tracking we see in some schools, one of the things we found in the political classroom is that we could predict what track students were in mm -hmm. by their social class. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was extreme. And, and that was worrisome to us. And we worked in one school that we actually wrote a chapter about in the book where the teachers for years had resisted tracking in social studies. So there wasn't tracking in history, there wasn't tracking in the required government class. And their reason for resisting it was because they wanted everyone together. Mm -hmm. 
and they thought that it was possible to be a you know highly skilled teacher and teach a, a range of students, and they actually did so very effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would I would agree. Practice matters, <laughs> right? How we engage the classroom, how we see our students matters, right? Um, that's actually what we get paid for is actually knowing our students well enough so we can fine tune our practice so that it moves them all rather than sort of sorting out a, a, a select group to get moved forward. Paul, I would just add that, that the research on, you know, if we believe that discussion in the classroom is an important democratic mm -hmm. skill that all students should learn as part of their democratic education, mm -hmm. um, the real, our research other, you know, for 20, 25, 30 years research has shown that the more the students most likely to get to even experience discussion in the classroom are higher social class and higher tracked. And so as you go down social class, as you go down the tracking, um, you're less likely to, as a student to even be invited to speak. So um, this is a real, I think this is one of the real problems um, of the way we've done tracking in, in public schools. Yeah, and the way we prepare teachers, I think, yeah. for teaching across, you know, all, you know, if we just want to take tracking as a given, I just can't imagine uh, waving my magic wand and getting rid of AP classes, even though that I think that might be better for, for society. Um, I don't know that we've trained teachers very well to to engage in the, you know, you know, to believe that all students can have these sorts of discussions. And I think that's one thing that the the, the book and our research overall has tried to promote is that this is not this is not something that should be given to only the the highest track student. Yeah, with the assumption that they may be fitter or more capable of doing the work right. rather than having them involved in doing the work and use that as a process of moving them forward collectively. So, so in your study, you focus on the pedagogical practices and the role of the educator uh, as an animator of interaction within classrooms. Um, and you describe three different ways of categorizing practice, best practice, um, discussion, and lecture. And you've alluded to a little bit, a little bit of this, but I, I'd love to hear what, what surprised you in your observations. Um, and from your vantage point, what contributed to the lack of uh, robust discussion and engagement? Well, I'll start. Um, one thing that surprised me is that the, there were some fantastic, I mean, it didn't really surprise me, but we don't want to send the message that it's bad to have high quality lectures. You know, we saw some great lectures and, and we, it's absolutely uh, a good thing, I think, to have high quality lectures at a variety of different, different levels. So we don't want to demonize lecture. Instead, what we want to do is figure out when you're trying to have high quality discussions, what should you do? And this distinction between high quality discussion classes and best pra and which we call best practice and then just um, classes that had talk was really the difference between what really is a great discussion and what is classroom talk and you know it's it's not that classroom talk was was meaningless or that there wasn't learning taking place it just was different than high quality discussion and what we found was that the teachers who engaged in high quality discussion had some things in common. One is that they had had really good teacher education and they had a lot of continuing professional development. Mm -hmm. So these were teachers who would be at the equivalent of the California Council for the Social Studies getting you know, high quality professional development. These were not teachers who, once they entered the classroom as first year teachers, decided that it, you know, they didn't need to work on their own craft. So they were kind of continual learners. They recognized that there really is no such thing as a good spontaneous discussion in a classroom, that students have to be prepared for discussion and teachers have to be prepared as well. And they were really committed to discussion as a democratic practice. You know, the reason that they felt it was important for all students to learn how to engage in discussion is that they wanted all students to learn how to engage in democracy. And so they were driven in their practice by a broader conception of the connection between education and democracy. Mm -hmm. I would add one thing that surprised me um, is that how appreciative students are of any opportunity to get to discuss. Mm -hmm. So even in um, 
even in what we might call, you know, I might have <laughs> called a medium quality discussion. Um, those students, when you interviewed them, are like, oh yeah, this is amazing. Like, really? And I realized because the, it's so rare that they even get the opportunity to sort of think and engage with one another. And so much of what counts as discussion in classrooms is really the student talking to the teacher. Um, so a lot of the, the you know, what didn't, what didn't count as best practice discussion was all comments going through the teacher. We were really looking for student to student speak, uh, speech. Um, but students, you know, they just being able to talk um, and engage in an idea and an issue, um, they find this highly engaging. And I think so much of what teachers think is what's highly engaging is when they, the teacher, speak. <laughs> so, um, so getting teachers yeah. and how hard it is for teachers yeah. to not yeah. talk in the classroom is really um, yeah. something that I noticed as well. Yeah, there's there's a a number of questions running through my mind uh, around that in particular. So, so one of the things I was thinking about is this idea of sort of teachers' pedagogical tools. As somebody who's been involved in a lot of teacher professional development, I'm oftentimes struck by. Um, how reticent teachers are to put their students in conversations, right? And, and I think some of it is rooted in teachers' own predisposition and a, a, a lack of desire to not do it well, or in increasingly diverse classrooms, you know, not want to, to, to slip up. And so oftentimes the way that teachers control that is to have a very didactic classroom, but it assumes that if the, teacher's, if the teacher's the only one doing the intellectual and the affective labor, then the students are not reaping the benefits of it, right? And so if a successful conversation is one that avoids controversy, how do we pivot? Because we know that controversy is useful for engagement. It's useful for uh, getting students invested. And it gives them the opportunity to, to flex their, not only their intellectual and their, and their, and their affective muscles, but also their ethical um, muscle. So how do we how do we begin to construct a pivot and move away from this culture of comfort where we're reticent to sort of step into the breach and engage in some um, robust disagreement, but with a sense of shared purpose and values? How do how do we begin to make the, the pivot, knowing that that's going to be a process, not not an event? Yeah, it's a great question. I think. Many teachers want to have really high quality discussions of issues that are controversial, but don't feel like they have the tools, which is why it's so important for teachers to have high quality teacher education and lots of professional development. Because there actually are some forms of classroom discussion that are good entry points for teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, there are different kind of levels of, of expertise that are, that are required. And I think one of the things that we've focused on in our professional development is to help you know, teachers mm -hmm. uh, learn those tools. But I also mm -hmm. think it's very important to develop the right norms in the classroom mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to help students understand what we mean by civil discourse. Mm -hmm. And that you know, to have controversy is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but controversy doesn't mean what we see on talk radio or what we mm -hmm. or hear on talk radio or, or see on, some news shows where you know it's just kind of people screaming at one another. That's the antithesis of what we want. So one of the things that we realized during the study is that there weren't a lot of models um, that teachers could point to so students could get a sense of what does this look like when it's done really well. And for that reason, it was really important for teachers, you know, to create a sense in the classroom of what is it that we're, we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite examples of this, not from the political classroom study, but from an earlier study, was a middle school teacher, brilliant middle school teacher, who at the end of the year would videotape her students having discussions of controversial issues. And then the next fall with a new group of students, she would show that video and she would ask the new students, you know, what are you noticing here? And that was a way for her to really give a, a very concrete representation of what she hoped and expected that these students would learn how to do throughout the year. I love that. I think that's great practice. It also gives students something to sort of to aim high. I think, you know, oftentimes if you keep the bar low enough, students will trip over it every time. But if we keep the bar high and give them the structures to uh, to reach that, they'll do it and they'll do it consistently. Yeah, Paul, I think you were going to say something. 
Oh, I was just going to add the the beginning of your question about, um, you know, you sort of mentioned that, that how to create that that culture of, mm -hmm. of of a teacher being willing to sort of open the floor for discussion even. And I think that that is an important um, understanding about discussion is that when you have real discussion in the classroom, it means that you're willing to share authority with the students over the discussion. Like you have to <laughs> give up some of the teacher control and be willing to manage and nurture a discussion. So you move from manage. <laughs> and I think that teachers do have a hard, a hard time doing that. But a lot of the time, I think that teachers imagine what they're imagining a whole class dynamic discussion with 30 students and all their hands are raised and it's amazing. Um, when really, you know, a well-crafted small group discussion or even paired discussion, that gets every that gets more voices into the room. It, it, it nurtures a, a certain amount of comfort. Um, and so designing, you know, as I talk a lot about how to design for discussion, um, is is partly your you you just as Diana's teacher wanted her students to imagine what that ideal discussion is. Teachers need to have that in their own heads mm -hmm. as well. What am I really trying to do? And then scaffold students toward that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, no teacher that does this well assumes that you can throw a single question out into a classroom and imagine that you're going to come up with 20 minutes of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it takes a lot of preparation on the pre-preparation on the part of the teacher to, um, to lay the groundwork for that. Yeah, I so appreciate that. Uh, years think about the importance of shared meaning making as a stance in the classroom. I think I've always probably been more pulled to that than the sort of performative aspects. But in those classrooms, students are almost always spend a significant amount of time in smaller constellations, smaller constellations of learners. And then we engage in some cross pollination so that they gain access to each other's thoughts. And, and you know, realistically, they may not always do it uh, coming out the gate really well, but I think the ability to engage in these discussions in the same way that one civic agency is a process that evolves over time, so too can a teacher's practice, provided they understand that the, the benefits for the students as well as for themselves are in shifting the burden of learning, both the cognitive and the affective load onto the students. And it actually frees us up as educators to be more available for our students. We can do more observation, we can do more redirection, we can fill the gaps in ways that don't leave students exposed, but actually uh, give them the joys of discovery <coughs> themselves. So we're gonna, we're gonna pivot into some audience questions sort of pretty, pretty quickly. Here some are coming. But, but one of the things I couldn't help but think about as I was preparing for this is conversations I've been in with my father you know, for a number of years, probably 30 years now at this point. He's a retired school educator, um, but he grew up in the segregated South. And so one of the things we oftentimes talk about is actually reframing the narrative of desegregation as one of um, a national victory to thinking about it as a moment of loss. Oftentimes we think about it in terms of the, the financial implications for administrators of color and teachers of color who lost their jobs and didn't fundamentally uh, get hired as, as schools were being desegregated. But I think what I'm considering a lot more these days are the loss of a political narrative and a loss of education as a sense of shared liberation, which was inherently political. So people didn't shy away from the conversations because they knew that there was something at stake and that they were all in it as a collective rather than as individuals. So how can we think about the moment of desegregation as a critical moment to reinterpret these conversations about civics and politics? Because I think it's very difficult to understand the stifling of politics without taking into account how the, um, the demographics of the classroom shift in that moment and how there are contingencies now in the classroom that weren't there when classrooms were more homogeneous, right? Um, does that resonate with you? Does that seem problematic? Or I'd love, love, love to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, you can think of the so-called CRT laws as an extension yeah. of that yeah. story you just yeah. told, right? That the Ooh, um, in. that in integrate, we've never fully addressed what the aims of integration are, yeah. um, and democratic education within integration is what you're talking about. And so, um, right, so you can, you know, in this, the, the question of how you teach 
the, our racial past or racist past, I should say, that um, can look very different in different communities. And part of the backlash is, well, we don't want that one in our community, right? So, um, you know, I think this is, you know, I don't have a, a great answer or a great response other than it's, um, it's yet another example of why public schools are such important sites for democracy. Um, and it's, you know, it's not that they're always pretty and smooth and it's all going well, mm -hmm. but people really care about the education of their children. And so that is a deep motivator for coming into a public institution and uh, act, activate, you know, being a, uh, advocating for change. And, and, and we have to sort that out. And that's a natural part of democracy. That's what we should be doing. Um, is working out our problems <laughs> in, in, democratically. The challenge right now is that it doesn't feel so democratic um, in, in the way we're approaching it. But I think that it's all a, a similar story, I think, in my, in what we're talking about. Great. And Diana, did you wanna? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a fantastic question. And one of the things that you know we really focused on in the political classroom study was how much, um, difference was there in the classroom, mm -hmm. you know, that I think anybody who's taught knows that all classrooms are diverse Absolutely. because there's a lot of different dimensions of mm -hmm. diversity. So mm -hmm. you're going to have, you could have religious diversity, gender mm -hmm. diversity, socioeconomic diversity, ideological diversity, et cetera. But we were really struck by the fact that in classrooms that were more homogenous along mm -hmm. a variety of dimensions of mm -hmm. diversity that really matter, the teachers had to work harder mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. high quality discussion yep. because there wasn't as much authentically occurring difference. In the classes that were more, um, especially ideologically diverse, it was the teachers still, in that case, often had to work hard on civility norms, <laughs> but there was a lot of naturally mm -hmm. occurring mm -hmm. difference. And one of the things that we really focused on is how important it was for students to hear different perspectives from other students you know in classrooms that we studied where the teacher was talking most of the time and the students weren't talking or they weren't talking about controversial issues the students thought that everybody in the classroom had the same views they had you know we asked this in interviews and the students were like yeah everybody here agrees well we know knew that that was not the case because we had student survey data that showed a lot of diversity in the classroom, but students didn't see it because in order to see it, they had to be able to literally hear students talk. Yep. So one of our findings was that high quality discussion activates the awareness of diversity in a classroom. And that awareness is really important because if you have you know, political friendships in a classroom that can be sustained even though you have mm -hmm. political differences, mm -hmm. you know, that in some ways is the holy grail of democracy. And you're never gonna oh, get yeah. there unless there's an opportunity to hear people with different points of view. Yeah, and I think we used to do that fairly well as a society, I think we've gotten away from it. The part of what I was speaking to is a culture of comfort is that the focus on similarity rather than difference. And I think when we're able to honor and understand our differences, the process of getting onto the same page or at least around some shared territory, I think is more beneficial and, and more broadly generative. So a question here from one of the audience members, how do we engage the whole classroom, not just the extroverted students? I'm thinking of the quiet students, female versus male energy, even if even as an adult, this is challenging. Uh, this is challenging to be heard. So I think it's how do we how do we bring in all students when some may feel reticent or not really uh, invited in the conversation, or there's actually power dynamics that make it a little less inviting. Uh, what would you lift up in terms of some of the practices you saw that had value, or from your own work? Well, I think there needs to be an expectation that all students uh, will be able to participate and will be expected to participate but to do that in a way that doesn't feel scary. Mm -hmm. And Paula mm -hmm. mentioned before mm -hmm. that a lot of the, the best discussions that we saw were small group or even pairs. And you know, in the cooperative learning literature, there's this saying that it's hard to escape from a pair. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I've seen mm -hmm. with a lot of really great teachers yep. is they have a lot of paired talk mm -hmm. because 
everybody is going to be talking that way. It's kind of like yeah. why you do scales at the beginning of choir practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mm -hmm. literally warming up. Mm -hmm. And I think there are, <clears throat> you know, ways of helping students, you know, build those skills that aren't threatening. One of the things that we know from um, a lot of research that's been done is that the reason students don't participate typically is not the teacher. It's that they're afraid of their peers mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and they're afraid of judgment by their peers. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be you know, processes and procedures in the classroom that break down that fear. Yep, yep, and yep. that also help, you know, some students need to learn how to talk more and some students need to learn how to talk less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I think just on a really basic level in the, um, is that there are all a number of discussion protocols and strategies. Um, we're big fans of structured academic controversy, which comes out of the cooperative learning literature as well. Um, but what you know, this is a, a you know, it's about a forty-five minute strategy that moves from students from pairs to small groups to whole class discussion about a controversial issue. Um, and what it's doing is in the design of the activity turn-taking is part of it, um, listening is part of it, repeating back what you heard is part of it. And so it it models the, the skills of discussion while students are discussing. So it's inherent to the activity. Um, and these and when you do it in class, I always point out, do you notice that you all participated, every single mm -hmm. one of you participated almost exactly equally today because um, just because of the design of the activity. And so again, if we get away from this beautiful seminar style thinking of that's what discussion is and think more about how we're designing with the, so when I design discussion, I don't think of the students who are all, I already know the seven students that are gonna participate, no problem. I'm thinking, who are my students that don't wanna yeah. participate? Yeah. What do they need? They need time to write before they think. Yeah. They need time to process before they, you know, with one person before the whole. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm designing for them, not for the, the eager participant. No, I appreciate that. And, and if I can, I'd, I'd love to put in a plug for, I used to work for Facing History and they have a really robust set of pedagogical strategies, many of which uh, are utilized to, to put students in conversation and I think, Again, thinking about the teacher as learner, how do we get teachers in the mix with organizations and others and structures that allow them to continue to develop as professionals? Because I think sometimes their own lack of agency about being able to sort of um, animate a classroom is what gets in the way. So I'm gonna pivot over to the phone here. So here's a question coming in from online. So there are several studies now about people moving to areas where there are people that align more so with their own political views. How do you see this playing out in classrooms? I mean, we've talked about this a little bit. Will this further entrench our echo chambers? And what I'll add to it is how do we get in the way of it? How do we interrupt these patterns? Because you've started to speak to that. Yeah, well this, um, you know, that phenomenon is called the big sort or the notion mm -hmm. that people are more likely now to move to communities where they are in ideological alignment and it's really pronounced mm -hmm. and it is causing you know all sorts of i think things to happen that are really threatening to democracy i think it is one of the reasons we have what's called affective polarization where it's not just that you say well that person has different views than i have but because they do i don't like that person i don't trust that person you know i i literally don't think that person um is is a good person, which that, you know, that is a very dangerous phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, or a democracy. And it's also frightening for Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it has lots of negative consequences. Right. But we, in the study, what we saw is that teachers in ideologically homogenous communities had to do things that were different than teachers in more heterogeneously uh, framed communities. And, and the teachers who were highly skilled knew this. They had specific things they did to expose their students to views that were not the dominant views of the community. And one of the things that was interesting is when we interviewed the students in high school, sometimes they'd be kind of angry about it. But when we interviewed them two and four years yeah, later, yeah. They would say, oh, yeah. thank heavens for, you know, Mr. Rogers. He insisted that we learn points of view that were different from our own. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm away from that community and in a community where there's more mm -hmm. 
um, ideological difference, you know, that's a, a good tool for me. It's something that is not so threatening. So I think it, it, um, it's, it's a challenge for teachers, but one of the things that we were really thrilled about is that we saw such great examples of how teachers dealt with that. Yeah, that, that last comment reminds me of Jane Elliott in the eye of the storm, or, or it's, it's the second version where students come back and they speak to that very directly. They're adults, they come back and they say, there's days when I hated you, but what I realize now is how much you helped us. Yeah, Paula. I'll just add on this, on this sort of echo chamber effect of, of schools is that I think the teachers in the study uh, it's very easy to be a teach if you are ideologically aligned with your te with your students. So a liberal teacher in a in a liberal school, a conservative teacher in a conservative school, it's very easy to just create sort of an insider mm -hmm. conversation in the classroom. We all agree with one another. Aren't we all smart and they're all wrong? Um, and this has very very bad effect. This is this is what triggers affective polarization. But the teachers in the study, um, I think they really that did this that were attentive, that saw the like-minded of their, of their school as a problem, they didn't want their students to be good at discussion among each other so much as they were thinking, I want you to go out into the public yeah. and be able to discuss with people who are different than you. And so I think that really motivated, I'm gonna bring in the ideas so these are not strange to you, that you can see them, that there's a reasonableness to, um, to views that you don't naturally agree with. Um, and try to try to cultivate that in the try to cultivate the value that we should listen um, first and foremost within the classroom, um, and that took a lot of discipline, I think, on the part of the teachers. It's really easy to just sort of, um, you know, you know, pat students on the back for agreeing with one another and with agreeing with you, um, and so it's to to really say, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push you to think harder than you have to than you would naturally think about this issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, there's another question that's from this audience here that's sort of following up on that. So given the media fragmentation and misinformation of the internet, do you think you could see the Department of Education endorse or republish lectures that explain explicitly political concepts? Now that's, that's assuming that political concepts as a set of ideas is going to solve the problems, but could you imagine that the Department of Education make some moves to help to counter some of these these patterns that we're seeing? Well, I think the, it depends on what level of government we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think the, the best thing the federal government can do is provide funding to, you know, high quality organizations that are developing fabulous curriculum and doing professional development. You mentioned Facing History, Constitutional Rights Foundation mm -hmm. in, um, you know, California would be another example, street law. There are a lot of organizations that are really uh, great at developing high quality curriculum, field testing it, making sure that it works, and also doing professional development. And it, there used to be a lot of federal money for those organizations. And when the, that federal money started drying up, it really had a pronounced effect. It was much harder for teachers to find <clears throat> opportunities to learn about you know how to do some of these things that are are hard to learn how to do so that my sense is that's what the federal government needs to do i think you know different state governments have taken different approaches i mean i'm a big fan of having some required classes that are really good natural sites for high quality discussion mm -hmm. about democracy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if you you know, in, in states where there's a requirement that all students are going to take a year of civics or government in, in high school, I think that's a good thing. Doesn't mean that, you know, the requirement by itself is not going to be enough, but at least then you have a, a class where it's easy to fit, you know, in high quality discussion. That being said, one of the things we know is that you can have good discussion in a lot of different subjects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're interested in democratic discourse, it doesn't have to be just talking about things related to democracy. You can have high quality democratic discourse in a literature class mm -hmm. that's going to build a lot of the skills that are not dissimilar to what we'd expect to build in a civics class. Agreed. I think what teachers really need um, maybe more than 
you know, the Department of Ed level um, support is actually at the local level, the school board and the principal who are willing to say, uh, we support the work, you need to do this sort of activity in the classroom, we need you to bring in political issues. So many teachers today are hearing, uh, don't touch anything that will make anyone upset. Yep. Um, Right, you know, I've heard so many teachers say, my principal say, you can do whatever you want until a parent complains. Um, and that's just such a terrible message to give a teacher. Um, and that what we want is for teachers to know how to do this well and then have the support of their community in doing it. And the and they, you know, principals are gonna have to have their backs and say, they're doing what we ask them to do and the, the, the school board supports it. And at the state level, you know, messaging to teachers that um, political issues or controversial issues or um, discussion itself belongs in the classroom. Just that is, you know, enough that we need teachers to know you're expected to do it. We support you doing it. Yeah, it's a challenging landscape out there, as I'm sure you know. I mean, you can look across districts and you can see some of them embracing the work and stepping forward and other ones are having these raucous um, school board meetings and a variety of other things that are really in some cases imposing ignorance about our past in a way that really makes it questionable whether or not we'll see our shared future together so i think uh these are definitely dicey times so uh here's an online uh participant sort of lifting up a question said you mentioned the importance of teacher training and creating a classroom culture that supports controversial conversation how do you suggest moving a politically diverse community culture forward? So it sounds like if I'm reading this right, it sounds like they've got the right political components that they have the diversity that you that you yeah. see is important yeah. to the foment. Yeah. Um, so, so what suggestions might you offer to them for navigating this present moment, knowing that we hopefully won't be here forever, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, um, if you're in a politically ideological or an ideologically um, diverse community, that is a deliberative asset mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you should take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't take advantage of it, you are really throwing away the, the backbone of democracy, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I think one of the challenges we're seeing is not so much how what teachers do in ideologically diverse communities. It's what you were saying before about this big sort phenomenon where we've got more ideologically homogenous communities and this expectation then that schools reflect the dominant ideology of the community. You know, it's mm -hmm. I think there are some parents who want schools to teach views that are absolutely aligned with their views mm -hmm. um, as opposed to saying, no, I want my my child to hear multiple and competing mm -hmm. views because I know that's important in terms of building up good democratic skills. I think it's just unfortunately kind of natural for people to say, well, if this institution isn't reflecting what I believe, mm -hmm. there's something wrong with this institution. And I think what mm -hmm. Paula was talking about before is changing the expectation that instead of saying, you know, we want your dominant view to be represented, but we want to make sure that students are being exposed to a range of, of views because it would be quite literally irresponsible if we didn't do that. And that is a big mindset change. It's, it's a significant one. And I think if we look at it with sort of, and speaking about it candidly, many of the things that people are opposing are the very histories of the students who are becoming the majorities in certain communities. And so we have a relatively small and highly vocal uh, minority in some cases, or maybe still in the majority in some some respects, really putting pressures on to limit the discourse in, in a way that um, stifles students access to to information that's not only reflective but relevant to the questions that they're asking about the world, right? Um, yeah. So so it is a dangerous moment. How how do we how can we support teachers? Because I think ultimately, you know as well as I do that when a when the door closes, teachers still have a, a tremendous amount of latitude and, and with which to teach. So how do we support educators and shore them up at this critical moment for the practice of democracy so that we can move forward as a collective? Because re realistically, that's the only way we're going we're gonna to move forward as a collective. And we have to sort of reclaim that sense of democratic imagination and a possibility. So how do we support teachers in this moment um, and help them? 
You know, that's a great, the great question. There's sort of the, um, in practical terms, um, I think that teachers need to get the message that, um, that there is a democratic purpose of schools that we're not just here to cover content and teach to test and that there's um, there's more to the the mission of schools and that we want them to engage in students thinking deeply about the world um and so and that's that's a hardship for teachers and for the public frankly um but there's even you know sort of a, a bigger question <laughs> of you know, schools are being used in this moment for as a political pawn in some ways. And a lot of the discontent happening around schools is manufactured um, for political gain. And so it's hard, I think, to be a teacher and think, I don't even know what critical race theory is and I'm being accused of doing it, right? And so, um, you know, to, and, and no one, and you know, you were doing what you're, the curriculum that you taught five years ago, no one questioned and suddenly it's, it's being called into question. And so, um, I, you know, I, it's just, there's a, there's a public need here to sort of think through um, what are, you know, you know, to what extent we're willing to use the schools in this way, because young people are the people who are being hurt if we don't teach them you know, truth, <laughs> you know, a funny thing called, tr called truth in a, a lot of areas of, um, you know, they, they're wanting to understand the world. Uh, I think also I'll just add that, you know, young people today, they're well aware of so many issues, you know, um, that are, you know, in their, in their media world. And yet they're having, they're getting very little adult guidance of how to interpret and make, make sense of it. And I think schools, Need to, need to take that role and help them think deeper um, about these issues. And so we need to just really think about what are we doing to young people when we manipulate teachers and schools in this way? Well said. So as you move into our literary our last couple minutes, I'm wondering if you can both close this out with maybe like a, a minute hot take, sort of looking forward into the, over the course of the next couple of years, what do you hope or anticipate will happen to get us back on the right track? That's not a lot of time, but, <laughs> you know. I think the main, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about the democratic purposes of schools, but uh, the reality is that schools right now are struggling with so many issues related. I mean, we have a tremendous teacher shortage in our state that we're dismantling teacher education programs um, to just sort of throw open the doors and get people in the classroom. Right. And, you know, I think we need to, take a moment and think about how how have we how are we currently constructing this profession um how are we luring people into the profession and how are we supporting them once they if if they do choose to enter it and so i think we have a lot of work to do um and that would get us you know getting the right sorts of teachers into the classroom and i don't by sorts of you know people who really want to engage students in deep thinking um and then helping teachers develop the skills and the community to help each other do that work. And so we kind of, we need to rethink, you know, just how we treat teachers when they walk in schools themselves and that they have, they have a professional role to play. They have expertise. They can work together to design good instruction for young people. Thank you. Diana? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I also think it's really important for people who care deeply about what's happening in the schools to um, stand up and run for school boards. One of the things I'm seeing in Wisconsin is we've got a, Reddit, a lot of people who would have been on school boards 10 years ago don't want to do that now mm -hmm. because it, that's become a difficult role. But we, we need people to do that. We need the involvement of people who really support public education and are 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 going to want to make sure that that we're not dismantling an institution that certainly has problems there's no doubt about it but the problems that we're going to have if we dismantle public education are so much worse than anything we could conceivably imagine so i think we have to be you know it's very easy to to tear down things it's very hard to build up things so i think we need to see this as a kind of crisis moment in schooling and and step up as much as we possibly can and i think part of that has to do with making sure that we make 
teaching an attractive profession, it is a profession mm -hmm. and we need to treat it as a profession. Yeah. And there's all sorts of things that we can do differently, I think, to um, bring you know people into teaching, keep, keep people in teaching. You know, I was just in Singapore uh, a couple months ago and there's no teacher shortage in Singapore. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason for that is that teachers are extremely well treated. And their one way that they're extremely well treated is they get a lot of really high quality professional development. So I think we, you know, a lot of it has to do with how we think about how we as the public you know, what we're gonna do to support our schools and what we're gonna do to support teachers. But I wanna end on a positive note. I told you, we just had this conference last Saturday here about teaching about the elections. So I saw lots and lots of teachers um, who were talking about what they were doing in their classes. They're doing, there are a lot of people who are doing high quality work all over the country. So I think one way that we can hold up teachers is to help people understand that, that there's, you know, I, I can, come up with teachers, you know, all over this country who I know are doing really great work and we need to laud them and yep. and support yep. them and and make sure that that is rewarded because then it's more likely that that's going to be replicated yep. more teachers are going to want to do that. Yeah. I couldn't be more in agreement with you about that last point. There are some phenomenal teachers and we need to to sh share share the love and and to let people know that. Well, Paula and Diana, this has been lovely, and um, hopefully we get to do it again, maybe in actually in the same physical room at some point, um, but I appreciate you being here tonight. And thank you to everybody uh, who has joined us this evening, those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who have joined us online. And of course, a special thanks to our speakers, Diana Hess and Paula McAvoy. Just a reminder to please complete the survey uh, when you receive it. Uh, and visit the commonwealthclub.org to find out more about future programs or to pick up one of those handouts by the door. Um, and to learn more about creating citizens. I'm Milton Reynolds. It's been a pleasure to be with you this evening and this concludes our program. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>